Uh, so I, I'm going to chat a little bit about worldwide threats to health security in the context of uh, 21st century viruses. Uh, I have no disclosures relevant to the presentations. I do get invited uh, for various lectures. Travel is paid. Honoraria goes to Emory. Uh, for identification only, I'm editor-in-chief of a couple of journals. What I say today may not represent the opinions of the Society of the Journals. I also spend half time working for the federal government uh, within the uh, Division of Research, Innovation, and Ventures inside of BARDA, working for the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Uh, my opinions today do not represent those of the United States government or any agency. With that, here's the talk map. I'm going to go uh, into a little bit of virology basics. I'm going to give an overview of 21st century viral epidemics, talk a little bit about all hazards response frameworks, and then some lessons learned. So let's get into it. Uh, what's a virus? This is Peter Medawar. For anyone who's been in transplant immunology or is a transplant recipient, he was the gentleman who made transplants safe uh, with various medications by describing the immune response to foreign items. Uh, he wrote advice to a young scientist, and he wrote about viruses, they're bad news wrapped in a protein. Uh, that was as far as the classification got until David Baltimore, uh, who discovered reverse transcriptase uh, and with uh, Howard Temin also won the Nobel Prize, uh, gave us a classification of viral pathogens. He uh, organized them according to their nucleic acids, which are shown in the uh, top row there. We're going to be focusing today on classes four and five uh, because those are the major pathogens that we have dealt with in the 21st century. Both are single, uh, all of those are single-stranded RNA viruses. Uh, some of them come in, in the, as the plus strand, such as coronavirus. They have to be transcribed into the negative strand. Some come freely uh, as the negative strand, such as measles, Ebola, and influenza. But again, most of our talk is going to be focusing on these single-stranded RNA viruses. Now, how many viral particles are there? There are about 10 to the 10th humans on Earth. Every liter of water in the ocean contains about that same number of viral particles. How many liters of water are there in the ocean? About 10 to the 21. So there are a whole lot more viral particles than there are of us. Most are bacterial viruses, most are in the oceans. And in the oceans, microorganisms are about 90% of the biomass, and viruses kill about a fifth of that, 20% of it each day. They are there to maintain the ecological balance of different species, and in so doing, they are responsible for the oxygen you're breathing right now. So viruses aren't all bad, but for your purposes, you can think of viruses as subcellular terminators. They are inanimate particles. They have no independent existence. They do one thing and one thing only. They invade the host cell. They steal information in the form of DNA or RNA. They replicate, and then they go ahead and they kill the host cell. Now, a lot of the time it's immediately, but they can integrate into the genome and uh, park there and come out at inconvenient times, such as we see in shingles or various uh, oncogenic transformations. That's all they do. Let's talk about two centuries of viral epidemics. Over on the left, I have the... Uh, uh, rank order by death, 100 million from the Spanish flu, 1918 to 1920, all the way down to about a million as a global pandemic, uh, 1968, 1969, the so-called Hong Kong flu. Look at the orders of magnitude and compare that with the 20th century, where <clears throat> our leading killer was H1N1 pandemic in 2009-2010. Ebola next in the 2013-2016 spread at 11,300. We have measles growing in the DRC, having killed more than 4,500 folks. Uh, the current Ebola outbreak is now at 2242, and as of last night, uh, COVID-19 caused by the novel coronavirus uh, is at about 1669. So the current outbreak that we're dealing with is two orders of magnitude lower than the worst killer in this century and uh, many, many orders of magnitude beneath the Spanish flu. Well, let's talk about influenza for a moment. And uh, it's all about species jumping. It turns out that the way you make new influenza viruses is you park 
uh, something that's a funnel, and in this case, avian viruses, all the bird flus, ducks are great reservoirs for uh, bird flus from a variety of species, and you put them into a mixing bowl, and it turns out the biology of pigs is an ideal place to mix different viruses. Now, over on the right, I'm showing you what happens when there's a co-infection. This is not influenza. To get two viruses, I had to show two different eukaryotic viruses, adeno-associated, and herpes simplex. That's a single nucleus that you're looking at, and you're looking at the expression of different vi parts of viral genome hooked to different chromosomes. It's very easy for two different viruses to co-infect cells. Well, this is the influenza genome, and this is why influenza is such a problem. Over on the left, you will see a bunch of double helices. It turns out that the influenza genome contains RNA, but they're in separate segments. And attached to the top of each of those RNA pieces is the influenza polymerase. Each virus brings its own RNA polymerase to make it easy for it to replicate and on the way tends to take out the host polymerase. Well, you get multiple influenza viruses, and now I'm talking about the right funneled into a single source. You put them into the mixing environment, and all of a sudden you have new viruses. So influenza is perfectly engineered by the process of genomic reassortment to keep making new forms of influenza. Uh, and if we take a look at what happened during the Spanish flu, this is from Bill Gates' Shattuck lecture in 2018. You can see that over the course of about six weeks, from a single index case in the United States, it basically spread throughout the uh, lower 48. Uh, very fast and killed worldwide about 100 million people in very short order. So when we fast forward to December the 10th of 2019, my boss's boss's boss, Bob Cadillac, who's the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, wrote about preparing for the next pandemic, and he said, quite frankly, we need to become better prepared to face the next pandemic. Make no mistake, it's not if there's another pandemic, it's when. And according to the study on pandemic, it was influenza by the White House Council, it could claim the lives of about half a million people in the United States alone. Again, look at the date, December 10th. Let me pause that for a moment. We'll talk a little bit about this particular organism, Ebola. Uh, and from a healthcare standpoint, what we learned during the Ebola epidemic is that our US hospitals and contemporary ICUs are physically and socially engineered to expand access and with our focus on family-centered care to encourage touch and interaction among the patient, family members, caregivers, and so forth. You can imagine how quickly something could spread in this environment. Uh, that brought us to uh, dealing with Ebola, and in 2014, the Emory Special uh, Communicable Disease Unit uh, took on three patients from the gray airplanes and transported to Emory into this type of environment. Let's hear from someone who was involved in that epidemic. Oh, before I get there, uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but we learned an awful lot during Ebola about how to put things on, how to keep them on, and take them off. The clinician that I am after my experience in this serious communicable diseases unit is very different than the clinician that entered this unit the first time that I got to take care of Kent Brantley. I think that every time I'm rounding in the hospital, I'm always looking at the complexity of situations that we are faced with. I think now I think that way about what are we doing in everyday healthcare that puts ourselves at risk and puts our patients at risk, and how do we identify that and then train around that. So this was the most recent wake-up call we had only about five and a half years ago now. So let's move ahead to the current top of interest, coronavirus. Coronaviruses are a bit different. The common cold is a coronavirus. The host, of course, is man. SARS, MERS, and the uh, novel coronavirus, I didn't change the name here, appears to have started in bats. Here it was the civet cat. Here it was the camel. We don't yet really under know, understand the intermediate host here, but we do know if we look at the genomic pattern that it has some similarities to uh, all of the coronaviruses listed, listed here. 
This is what we're facing today. It's not yet everyday healthcare in the Western world, but certainly in China, this is uh, the sort of behavior we're seeing. Now, this is the West, of course. Here's the Diamond Princess docked off the coast of Japan. Here are people coming back from China into the United States. And most recently, China has said, we don't have enough places to put people. So they are seizing hospitals and also hotels uh, to fight the disease process, to keep people quarantined. Now, on February 1st, 2020, the New York Times reported first that the viruses would travel only about six feet. It was unknown how they, long they live on surfaces. They drew the comparison to measles, and they said they can travel up to 100 feet. So if people felt pretty safe, but it certainly didn't explain this behavior of the Wuhan coronavirus versus the spread of SARS two decades earlier. These data were taken to provide some kind of an estimate, at least of how far and how fast the virus could spread. And the basic uh, reproduction rate of the virus, so-called R0, was estimated from these data that ended on the fourth of this month, so uh, ending about uh, two weeks ago. This was the spread of the virus in uh, Hubei, and it was mapped to this exponential curve, uh, whose equation is shown her here, that led to an R naught of about 4.36. What does that mean? The R naught is the average number of people an infectious person will infect, assuming that the rest of the population is susceptible. These dots here show the minimum to maximum estimate of R0. You will note here that flu here is about four and a half. So here's COVID-19, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. It doesn't seem to be um, nearly as bad, if you will, compared to measles or chicken pox um, that uh, are major killers today. Now, the problem with those estimates is that they're based on sampling. Here are four patterns of spread. In each case, you have five different people who are detected as having the virus, but depending on what's going undetected in the transmission uh, profile, you may end up with very different estimates of R0. So that that initial estimate of 4.36, it's a guess, no more. What we do know is that in our connected world, there's much greater opportunity to spread. Over here, again for the New York Times, when SARS broke out, there were about a billion travelers. Passenger traffic in the world's airlines has increased by a factor of four over the past two decades. This is the current worldwide air transportation map. And as we've learned, this virus can wander onto airplanes and wander off, to, off into populations at will. I pulled this off uh, the Johns Hopkins site this morning. Total confirmed cases was just under 70,000. Total deaths really quite modest at about 1,670. Obviously, all of that depends on the veracity of the data that's coming out of China. And at the moment, that's not clearly determined. But the map shows you that by far the greatest concentration of the current infection is in China. Now, again, going to Bill Gates' Shattuck lecture, this is a simulation of what would happen if the Spanish flu was introduced to the world today. The estimates are that within about six months, about 32 million people will have died. Now, that's based on a virus that has a significant severity and a significant amount of transmissibility, but these are the best available working numbers which leads to why there has been developed an all-hazard approach to initial characterization of an unknown pathogen. This review appeared in Nature Microbi uh, Microbiology. I commend it to you. It appeared about this time last year, and they basically wrote the playbook for what's done with a modern viral epidemic. Initially, there's detection. There is an attempt to identify the pathogen through nucleic acid sequencing. There is next an attempt to provide a snapshot of who's gotten the virus and what types of wildlife they've been exposed to, because again, this is all based in new zoonotic diseases. 
the transmission chain is attempted to be identified, and then the spread is mapped and predicted. Very much the playbook that's been followed over the past six weeks. How is this going to be treated? I'm going to mention only one medical countermeasure, the antiviral medication, in this case, remdesivir. Remember I told you that these are both single-stranded RNA viruses. They carry their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the enzyme that copies the viral genome into the host for further replication. These polymerases, because they're there to go grab bits of nucleic acid, they're kind of indiscriminate about what they incorporate into RNA. They're more than willing to make a few few mistakes to get as much information as they can. So that this particular drug, which is uh, shown here, they're ramping up mass production in China, it's really quite simple. Here's the prodrug, and that prodrug gets hydrolyzed into a triphosphate, which is really just a cyanide moiety attached to garden variety ATP. That's all it is. It's ATP with a slightly different shape, gets incorporated by the viral polymerase. Fortunately, our host polymerases say, no, we're not going to take this one. And that's how it works. Why six months on that simulation? Because typically there's a six month interval from an influenza vaccine strain selection to actually getting it out into the public. This is the current timeline. This is how the annual United States vaccine uh, supply is generated. Again, about a six month interval from the point at which it's selected to the point at which the vaccine becomes available in your local drugstore. That's obviously not fast enough. So the government agency I have the privilege of working for, BARDA, has been involved in many produ uh, countermeasure productions. Uh, since 2007, there have been 54 FDA approvals, licensures, and clearances. If you read up in this region, you'll see a lot devoted to Zika. Uh, there is a great deal of activity at BARDA going on today, seeking input for countermeasures against this novel coronavirus. Uh, and it's safe to say we will be seeing uh, new production going on of uh, novel countermeasures in the near future. So there are some lessons learned from all of this. The first is, as uh, Perlman wrote in the New England Journal a couple of weeks ago, another decade, another coronavirus. We had SARS in uh, the, uh, the early years of this, uh, se of this century. We had MERS about a decade ago. It's very clear that even after this current one is over, another one will happen. There will be a global response and it will eventually be controlled. The problem is, is that healthcare workers who are involved in this um, are going to become infected and some of them are likely to perish. This happened in SARS, it's happened in MERS, and it's clearly happening uh, with COVID-19. So we are rightly concerned with the exotic and the novel. Here is the current Ebola outbreak uh, as it is occurring in the DRC. However, the greater risks are more familiar. And I remind you that the Spanish flu was the second deadliest plague in history and wiped out 3% of the world's population within, the mat within a, about a year. What is the worst case scenario here in the United States? So far we've been able to contain it, but I think uh, this virus is probably with us beyond this season or beyond, the, beyond this year, and I think eventually the virus will find a foothold and we will get community-based transmission and uh, you can start to think of it in a sense like uh, seasonal flu. Uh, the only difference is we don't understand this virus. That is the director of the CDC, Robert Redfield, earlier uh, last week. So I leave you with the question, what are your institutional plans? What are your personal plans when your hospital's emergency department calls you to see patients who have a sudden onset, rapidly worsening respiratory illness. Thank you.